Welcome to the Osmosis Daily Report on the coronavirus pandemic. I'm Dr. Risha Desai. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Osmosis. I'm also a pediatric infectious disease physician, and I used to work at the CDC in the Division of Viral Diseases doing outbreak research. Today we're going to talk about remdesivir. There's a great study that came out of New England Journal of Medicine looking at all the patients that have been on remdesivir on a compassionate care basis. And so we now have data on those folks and can learn from that experience. And just as a quick reminder, remdesivir is a nucleotide analog. And what it does is it basically uh, tricks the viral RNA polymerase and blocks it from doing its job. So to be part of this compassionate use protocol, patients had to have an oxygen saturation of 94% or less. And they had to have fairly healthy kind of kidneys and, and uh, liver uh, function but also they had to make sure that they agreed not to use any other antiretrovirals that were under investigational uh, use. Fairly straightforward uh, dosing. They were given a 200 milligram dose on the first day, and then for days two through 10, they were given 100 milligrams for each of those days. So 10 days altogether. And you can see in total, they had 53 patients as part of the cohort, and they came from all over the world. They had uh, the majority from the US, but also from Japan, Italy, Austria, France, Germany, Netherlands, uh, Spain, and Canada. So uh, a very wide variety of uh, treatment settings to see if this was working uh, across the board. So I know you're wondering, did it work? And here's the data. It looks like uh, 36 out of 53 of those patients did better, so 68% whereas eight out of 53 patients did worse. Uh, seven of those eight actually died. So 15% did worse, 68% did better. And let's actually dive in and look at this in a little bit more detail. This is the table they show us, and you can see at the top is the baseline, so people coming into the study, how are they doing? And the lighter color means that they were basically doing better. The dark red is kind of the scary uh, invasive, they were doing very poorly. And on the, the y-axis on the left, you can see this is how they were doing after treatment. So you, you basically want to go from a dark color to a lighter color. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the y-axis over here has a couple of extra categories like death and discharge. Obviously, those were not categories that were relevant uh, when they were at baseline. And those eight patients that did worse, you can see it was the uh, invasive group that really accounted for most of that. Six of those eight patients were in that invasive group out of 34. Six of them died. In the non-invasive group, uh, there were seven in that group, one person there died, and then one person got bumped up to an invasive level of care. So those are the patients that did worse. On the plus side, the people that did better, you can see you've got uh, many of the invasive patients out of 34, a total of three plus eight plus eight, so 19 patients actually performed better, you know, got to a lower level of care, non-invasive, low flow, ambient, or discharged. Uh, among non-invasive, you can see five of those seven people actually got better uh, and were all discharged. Among low flow and ambient, everybody got discharged. So it's very clear that in the very low acuity setting, you know, remdesivir did very well. In the higher acuity setting, a little bit less well, but still overall pretty well. And if you're wondering when the improvement happened, they have a nice little graph here that shows days since initiation of remdesivir. And you can see the patients basically on the, on the uh, y-axis you have improvement. The improvement is pretty steady. So some improved a little bit later, some improved earlier, but pretty straight and steady line there. It's not like you're seeing all the improvement right up front or right at the end of this four week period of follow up. Now let's try to address the question of is remdesivir safe? Now we know that it's gone through phase one and phase two trials previously. So in general, the thought is that it's fairly safe because that's kind of what those trials are for. But here we have more data on safety. So let's just take a look and see what they show. Initially, the top line of this is that 32 patients, so about 60% reported adverse effects or events uh, during that follow-up period. So let's just take a look at that table. So in terms of any adverse event, again, 60% of folks did have something. And you can see what they reported, everything from diarrhea to rash to low blood pressure, hypotension, atrial fibrillation, it goes on. Now we know that these are very severely ill patients, and so in that context, I just wanna uh, remind us all that it is hard to know whether this is because of the medication or because of something else like COVID-19 that they're dealing with. So it becomes kind of messy data, but nevertheless, uh, without a control group, we, we don't really have a good way of identifying what the cause is here, whether this is all due to the medication. But this is what we're seeing. Uh, that there is a, a long list of uh, potential adverse events that were reported in this study. 
Even more telling is the fact that four of the patients had to stop remdesivir, and the reasons are listed here, uh, renal failure, multiple organ failure, two because of elevated uh, liver enzymes, and one uh, of which also had a, a rash. So this gives you a little bit of insight into the clinical perception at the time in terms of who really needed to stop it. And so you're seeing that at least a handful of patients did need to stop it. And you've seen the data in terms of who, you know, who benefited and who didn't, but there's one part of the discussion I think is worth noting is that they, they point out that this is a very sick cohort of patients that got remdesivir. They said you know many of them were in, on invasive ventilation, 8% uh, were on ECMO, and in that group we expect mortality to be quite high. And so this is not your run-of-the-mill group of COVID-19 patients. This was kind of a selected group that was already doing probably quite poorly to qualify for even trying this uh, compassionate use basis uh, of remdesivir. So it's in that context that now we have data from Stat News that's an early peek at data uh, from the Gilead trial. So let's take a look at what data they're uh, showing us based on their kind of uh, early reporting. And a couple of quotes here. This is a quote from... Kathleen Mullane, uh, who's the ID specialist over at University of Chicago, uh, reports that they had recruited at, at that hospital 125 patients uh, to be part of the trial. And of those folks, 113 had severe disease. They don't define what that means, but we presume that means, you know, being an ICU level of care. Now, here's the attention-grabbing headline. They said out of that many people, the best news is that most patients have been discharged and that only two patients have died or perished, which is incredible compared to what data, you know, we just saw from NEJM. And then here's the last part. They say that most patients are severe and are leaving at six days, meaning they're not even staying for the whole 10-day course, which means that, you know, those side effects and adverse events that we talked about, maybe there's less of that if you need less of the medication to be effective. Uh, and they said that actually only about three patients needed all 10 days. So this is a big, big study. This is just one site. And so we have to look at what is happening at all the sites to get you know, a better picture of the study. But this is actually very encouraging information, obviously. So thanks for tuning in. Hit the red subscribe button or the bell icon to get daily updates and check out osmosis.org slash COVID-19 for all of our resources. Remember to help us flatten the curve and raise the line. We're all in this together. Thanks a lot. Be well.